Okay, switching to English and recording. Um, so, so today I, I um, I'm going to give this seminar, which I gave on Monday to this um, group uh, uh, in Poland, and it's about some recent work that I've been doing um, in uh, quantum Bayesian networks. So, um, the main motivation is um, not necessarily thermodynamics. Uh, for me, it's thermodynamics, but what I'm going to talk about is actually uh, uh, extends beyond thermodynamics. But um, the basic idea is that um, sometimes we have uh, things uh, or processes uh, or quantities which depend on processes, not states. So thermodynamics is a good example of this, right? So thermodynamic quantities such as heat and work, they are not functions of state. They are functions of the processes. So they're a function of the transformation from one state to another. Um, and so characterizing these quantities in the quantum regime is a big issue because uh, you have the measurement invasiveness. If you want to actually measure the quantity, measure the system uh, to um, obtain a quantity, for instance, in two points in time, then the measurement can be invasive. And this makes the process uh, extrinsic. So I like to use this word extrinsic here because we like to think of properties of nature as being intrinsic of an, an, an object or a system. So uh, the property depends only on that system or the process or, or on the process we are executing. But uh, in quantum mechanics, um, the process depends not only on that, but also on how you probe it, right? So, so also on how, how you try to access it. So, so uh, if I do an experiment and another person does an experiment, we may get different results unless we're very careful on exactly what kind of measurements protocol we use. Right? And this is fundamentally different than uh, what happens, for instance, in classical physics, where a process like the, the mass of a particle or the uh, frequency of a spring or something like that is um, uh, intrinsic of that spring, is independent of who measures it. Right? Um, so, so I think that's a very unique feature of quantum, quantum um, uh, systems. So the work I'm going to talk about started um, uh, really in this experimental paper, which was like a big motivation. Uh, and it was executed by uh, Kaunami Kade uh, under the supervision of Eric Lutz from Stuttgart. Uh, then we have this paper, which formalizes uh, our approach to this problem. Is uh, We introduce here what we call the quantum Bayesian networks. This is going to be the main topic of this talk. Uh, and then we have uh, three more papers, which discuss ki kind of like consequences of this framework. We first show how it can be used to, to provide experimental validations of fluctuation theorems. So this is another experimental paper. We also show how to compute these Bayesian networks experimentally. So we provide a method for computing them. And finally, I'll discuss uh, uh, some of the work done by Marcelo uh, on um, how, to, how can we apply these Bayesian networks to make uh, 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 predictions about work. Uh, but this one, I'm not gonna talk too much because Marcelo will give a lecture about this. So I don't want to give too many spoilers. Um, OK, so uh, this paper, this is from our first experimental paper. It, and this was our big motivation for us. So what we did here is this idea of reversing the direction of heat flow using quantum correlations. Um, so the setup is, is like this. Suppose you have two qubits. One is hot and one is cold. You put them in contact with each other. Then uh, heat flows from hot to cold. So they both become warm. Uh, if you want to reverse this, if you want to break this, di this directionality, you have to pay a price. You have to spend some resource. Uh, and what was demonstrated theoretically in these two papers is that this can be done using quantum correlations. So you now have two qubits, which are locally thermal. So locally, they are in thermal states at different temperatures. But globally, they are in a correlated state. And this can be implemented, for instance, using this kind of uh, initial state. You have like. Uh, the thermal states for A and B, plus some extra term which introduces some coherence with a parameter alpha, uh, uh, which is like a completely global coherence. It doesn't appear in the reduced states. And now we make them interact. Uh, and uh, if we adjust things right, if we, in particular, if we adjust this, this uh, um, constant alpha right, we can actually um, uh, consume these correlations to make heat flow from cold to hot. Right, so so it, this is exactly like we consume electricity to make the um, to run our fridge, our refrigerator. Uh, this is exactly the same idea. Uh, we we consume quantum resources 
to uh, make the heat flow from, content, from cold to hot. Um, okay, and here are some of the plots. Uh, so this is the energy as a function of time. And what we have to look at is uh, blue is uncorrelated. So this blue would be standard thermodynamics and yellow would be the correlated case. So this scenario is such that this guy goes down, meaning hot to cold. But if they are correlated, you get cold to hot. So it goes up. And here we plot the mutual information, which is a measure of global correlations. And you see that exactly in the correlated case, in order for it to go up, it actually consumes mutual information. So you're actually spending mutual information to make the heat uh, flow from hot, cold to hot. So this was a big motivation for us uh, because after we did this work, uh, uh, one gets into the question of how can we actually measure this heat, right? So uh, how, how do we actually go there and measure this heat exchange in this case? Uh, in our paper, we kind of cheated, not, not so much, but a little bit, uh, because we used full tomography. So we actually have the, had the, the, the full density matrix of qubits A and B at different instants of time. Uh, and so from two to full tomography, we actually reconstructed the heat. But we, heat, we would like to make it uh, something observable. So something that we can actually go there and just measure it, right? Um, uh, like we would do in classical thermodynamics, or at least something that looks like that. So um, uh, we can define heat stochastically as being the energy difference between um, uh, the eigenvalues of system A or the eigenvalues of system B. These are equivalent definitions. And the standard, standard way which would be used to measure this is to do what's called the two-point measurement protocol. So the idea is very simple. We first measure A and B, um, um, in their eigenbasis. So we start with here a, oh shit. Yeah, see, this is the bug that I was talking about. Yeah. So I guess I can't draw, I can't draw. So yeah, I definitely can draw. Okay, so no drawings this, this time. <laughs> yeah, so we start with A and B. Uh, we measure either A or B or both of them. Uh, so we measure before the unitary and after the unitary. And then from, from comparing the two, uh, uh, we can actually uh, infer the heat. But this is a problem because of the first measurement. So here's the initial state that I wrote before. Uh, and so you have these populations in here, which are like the thermal populations. And here's that parameter alpha that I mentioned. But if we now measure in the energy basis, what we get is that uh, uh, this, this alpha here is gonna get killed. The, the final state uh, after this measurement, rho prime uh, is, is there is no alpha anymore. So the, the, the TPM destroyed these global coherences. And so if we now apply the unitary starting from this state, we're actually going to get something different uh, than if we had started the unitary from this state. So uh, the fact that we did a, a measurement before the unitary makes all the difference in the world, right? So, so uh, the TPM is really not such satisfactory as a way of measuring the heat in the previous example that I mentioned. Uh, there are several alternatives for this. Um, there's an old one called operator of work, which uh, people mostly don't like because it doesn't have like a very clean thermodynamic behavior. There's a lot of research on quasi probabilities, which are essentially probabilities that can be negative. But uh, that's interesting because these negativities are associated to quantum contextuality. So there's uh, some research in there. And uh, our approach is what we call the quantum Bayesian networks. Uh, uh, and this is what I'm going to talk about this seminar. So the basic idea of a quantum Bayesian network is as follows. Suppose you have a system uh, which is prepared in a generic state. So uh, uh, some populations S and some states S. And this is the global system. So in the previous example, this would mean the global AB system. Um, and we assume that the universe, so this global system, evolves unitarily. So the state row evolves to a row of t, which is just the application of some unitary, right? Uh, as far as eigenvalues and eigenvectors are concerned, what then happens is that the populations are changed, but the eigenvectors rotate. So essentially, each population remains the same, but the eigenvectors, they start to evolve in time, right? Um, so what we do now to build the Bayesian network is we, we define a set of uh, instants of time. So T0, T1, T2, and so on um, uh, that we're interested in. 
And at each time we build this conditional probability, which is essentially the probability of finding the system in an arbitrary state X of T, can be any state you want, given that uh, its eigenstate is at uh, UTS. So, so is, is at the evolved state uh, uh, S of T. So uh, then the idea of the network is that we have the system, the system is evolving like here, like independently. We never touch the system, so we never measure it. There's never any direct measurement in the system. Uh, but at each time we, we associate, like we, we pull down here, a, a associated conditional probability saying that for instance, in time two, what is the conditional probability that I get to find the system in this state given that it's in this state and so on. And so the, the joint probability distribution is just going to be a sum over all paths. So a, a sum of, sorry, a sum over all uh, initial states S of these populations S and times these conditional probabilities like from here to here, from here to here, from here to here, from here to here, and so on. But we never measure the system. We just kind of build this object. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit more in a second. I know that this may look a little bit artificial, but I promise it will make more physical sense uh, soon. So the idea is that the system is evolving. Uh, in this language of Bayesian networks, we would call the system the, the hidden layer. Like this part is hidden we never measure it, but we just think at each point associate a probability of finding the system in some other state X um, in this way. Gabriel. Yeah. So the difference between this Bayesian uh, quantum Bayesian from the classical is that you don't use that classical Bayesian theorem, like Bayes theorem, to to obtain the conditional probability. You 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 use that the quantum version of it that like that. Right, that's a good point. So exactly that, that that's exactly right. Uh, um, it's, but essentially, we're building this this uh, Bayes uh, theorem without assuming that there are actually measurements. So so uh, I'll show some examples in a second. I think that that will help to clarify. But the idea is that, for instance, if we are here, we associate the probability of being fi of finding the system here, but we don't assume that we actually measure the system in this basis. So so the system is is never really perturbed. That's the idea. But other than that, you're right. Uh, we we essentially building using Bayes rule. Uh, in, in classical Bayes, you have to to have the measures. Yeah, but in classical Bayes rules, you, you, I mean, we don't we also don't take into account these measurements, right? In in, in mm -hmm. classical Bayes theorem, theorem, there's also no back action. Yeah. All right. Cool. So, um, what's interesting about Bayes uh, uh, QBNs? is that, so they always lead to a valid probability distribution. I mean, it's, it's strictly non-negative, normalized and so on. It's, it's a, a valid measure. Uh, if we marginalize over any variable, we always get something genuine. So, so uh, and we also get something which is non-back acted. I'll show an example in a second. Uh, but the idea is that um, if we come back here and we want to say, well, I, I, I don't want this guy. I, I want to throw this away. Then the re resulting distribution we're going to get from this, this, and this would not be affected by this. And if, if we had done the measurement, then uh, even if we marginalize it, there would still be a perturbation. But since we didn't do the measurement, we can just marginalize over any variable we want. Um, and also this choice of path, what I'm calling here the variables x0, x1, x2, and so on, this is very general. So, so one example, uh, connecting now to the previous uh, scenario that we discussed, is when you have a global system like AB, and um, uh, which is evolving unitarily, but you're interested in like local um, uh, quantities, so a local basis AI BI at different instants of time. So uh, as we saw, heat is defined as a change in energy of system uh, A or B, uh, and so if we now have a Bayesian network like A0 B0 A1 B1, we can compute the heat distribution from this Bayesian network. So this would be a distribution of heat, which completely avoids any kind of measurement back action, but still leads to a perfectly valid distribution of heat. And we can also compare it with uh, the two-point measurement. So here I'm going to write down the, the QBN explicitly for that heat exchange uh, problem. So uh, uh, essentially the QBN is, is uh, the systems have, have, the system have different, um, states s and probabilities ps so we sum over s uh, and then at each time here there are only two times right uh, uh, we, we com com 
construct these conditional probabilities. So, so at S0, uh, what's the probability of finding the system A in A0 and B in B0? So this is like a global state, but these are local states. And same for A1, B1. And more explicitly, this is given by this. Uh, I'm sorry here, this is uh, um, flipped. So this guy is actually this guy and this guy this, is this guy. Sorry about that. So essentially the idea is that initially the system is in a global state S and we associate a conditional probability of finding it uh, in A0, B0. And then we evolve the system UTS and we associate the probability of A1, B1. And so for instance, if we now marginalize over A0, B0, so we, we marginalize over the initial time, uh, what we're going to get is just the evolved state, so the, 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 the uh, untouched evolved state uh, uh, sandwiched in A1B1. So this is exactly what we would expect for the expectation values of A1B1 if we hadn't done any measurements initially. So that's the idea of the QBM. And what's interesting is uh, to con contrast that with the two-point measurement. So in the two-point measurement, we first measure uh, before the unitary. So this part here is the same as above. Uh, it's not changed. But now in the TPM, uh, this act of measurement is assumed to, to, to collapse the state to A0, B0. So you see that what enters here is now A0, B0. So this is essentially what changes, is that here we're associating uh, the state S, which evolves to UT times S. But here what's evolving is A0, B0 to U times this guy. And that's essentially the main difference. And now if we marginalize over A0, B0, so we sum this function over A0, B0, we get something which looks similar to this, but instead of having rho here, the initial state, we have the defaced rho. So we have this D of rho, which is just the, the defaced version of the state rho in the basis A0, B0. So this is that example that I, I showed before where the TPM kills the coherences. Uh, what enters in the TPM is the state evolved without the coherences. And that's, that's where the problem is. Um, okay, so I now wanna start with a first application of this, um, of these ideas. So um, we're going to consider a generic two-step uh, uh, QBN like in the heat exchange, but here I'm also going to include the initial state S so I don't sum over S. This is like the same formula I wrote before, but there is no sum over S. Uh, and we're also going to construct a reverse trajectory where you start in another state S star. And then instead of going from zero to one, you go from one to zero with the time reversed unitary. And if we now do the ratio of these two probabilities here, uh, we get this uh, kind of structure. And let me explain what, what's each term here. So uh, the first term is the change in the dif difference in initial temperature times the heat. Then we have these two terms, which are uh, stochastic versions of mutual informations. So they're uh, like the stochastic analogs of the mutual information of the um, initial state and the mutual information of the final state. We have these sigma terms, which are stochastic versions of relative entropies. So they're essentially measuring how much uh, systems A and B were pushed from their initial states. And we have this term gamma, which is like a dynamical term that has zero average, which is, uh, we don't have a great interpretation for it, but it's essentially associated to, um, uh, oops, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, which is essentially associated to um, uh, the dynamics of the forward and backward processes. And so uh, um, that, uh, ratio that we had before implies what was co called an integral fluctuation theorem, which mean that, means that this average is equal to one. But uh, one of the nice things that we found was that um, some of these terms, they individually satisfy fluctuation theorems. So in particular, the mutual information, the relative entropies, and this dynamical term gamma, they individually satisfy fluctuation theorems. Uh, uh, and moreover, we can also split the mutual information into a classical information and a quantum discord. So stochastically, we can split this information uh, into as, here i is uh, zero or one, right? So the initial and final uh, versions, we can split it into a classical information and a quantum discord, and they also satisfy fluctuation theorems. So we actually show this experimentally. This is uh, from uh, our latest experiment, which hasn't been published yet. Uh, so what we plot here, is all these different quantities. So like all possible quantities 
um, um, I0, J0, uh, blah, 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 the quantities that I showed you, uh, we plot their values for a certain process. And you see that they're all one. There are the, these two guys which are a little bit off, but this is numerical error. Uh, um, our, the, the next version of our, of our, um, uh, of, of our paper is going to have error, bar, er, error bars. Sorry. Uh, so when we have error bars, this will be like, OK, but we, we didn't put er, error bars in this case. Uh, but essentially, they are all one. So we average these quantities, and we get one in all cases. Uh, and here are also some other uh, plots from the same experiment. Uh, so what is plotted here is the forward and backward heat distributions in uh, both correlated and uncorrelated cases. So the reason why this is interesting is because of this relation here. Um, if we plot, if we compute the heat distribution and the ratio, so it's the forward heat uh, Q and the backward distribution of minus Q, we get something which is the exponential of delta beta Q divided by some strange uh, complicated function psi of Q. But this function is uh, different from one only when the systems are correlated and it's exactly one when they're uncorrelated. So if there are no correlations, like in this case, then uh, essentially if we plot the log of this, it's just gonna be the log of this exponential. So it's gonna be delta beta Q. And this is what's shown in, this, in these two plots here. Um, uh, essentially, what we're plotting here is the log of the ratio of the probabilities. Uh, and Q can only take three values, minus 4, 0, and 4. So if they're uncorrelated, you get a straight line. I know that this straight line is not fantastic because there are only three points, but still, uh, for this qubit model, this is the best that we can do. But essentially, if we look at the green line, you get a nice straight line here and here as well. This is for one instant of time, and this is for another one. Uh, however, as, uh, and this, this straight line behavior is uh, what's predicted by uh, now famous uh, fluctuation theorem by Jarzinski and Wojciech, um, which funny enough, I learned they worked at the university that I gave the seminar. So uh, I didn't know that, but they worked there. Um, actually, I think Wojciech worked there and Jarzinski vis visited there because I think Jarzinski is uh, like American, but uh, um, um, has some Polish descent the center, something like that. So he also spent some time there from what I understood. Um, yeah, so then as long as there are correlations, like in this case, then this function here is no longer one. So this, this uh, plot of the log of this ratio will deviate from a straight line. So this is what's shown here in pink. Uh, you see that the, the slope from here to here is different than the slope from here to here. Uh, so it, it, the function doesn't behave like a straight line. It would be great to observe this in more complicated processes where heat can take on many values and we could really see this like nonlinear structure. But for this uh, experiment, this is the best we could, we could do. Okay, any questions or comments? Something that I was thinking here. This is kind of a quantum version of that paper by Sagal uh, about quantum Bayesian networks, right? Well, you're right. Yeah, yeah. So there's a big connection. Yeah, this is like a quantum version. You're right. I, I was thinking. About, I, was, I was looking at the the paper here to see the difference. I saw, saw that it's all classical there. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's um, uh, the, 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 that causal networks kind of stru stru uh, yeah. Uh, paper. Yeah, mm -hmm. that this is the quantum version. Yeah. Okay, um, so I will keep going then. Um, QBNs, as I have shown, they have nice properties, but they may seem a little bit artificial because uh, in the experiments, for instance, we had to reconstruct them from full tomography. So that's not great, right? We want probabilities to be associated to the outcomes of experiment. I mean, the reason why we like probabilities is because there's an experiment that there's a probability of obtaining different outcomes. Uh, so we want to be able to associate probabilities to uh, directly the outcomes of an experiment, not to have to reconstruct some probabilities from the tomography. Um, if we wanna have like a single system, then this is impossible. Uh, because exactly uh, in that case, we would fall back into the two-point measurement scheme. So that's kind of the whole point of using QBN, QBNs was exactly because 
for just a single system, there's nothing you can do. Uh, uh, you always end up uh, with the two-point measurement. Uh, but what we have recently shown is that you can actually do this if you use multiple identical copies. And uh, this is uh, something which I think is quite nice because uh, it means that you cannot obtain the Bayesian networks from the outcomes of a single experiment in a single system. But if you have access to multiple identical copies of a system, which we often do uh, in practice, then you can actually uh, associate the QBNs with these uh, outcomes. So uh, the, the trick is post-selection. So let me illustrate the idea by considering a two-point QBN. If you want two point, if you have you want two points, you need two copies. If you want n points, you need n copies. So a two-point QBN would have this, this kind of structure. We sum over all initial states, probability of the initial states, and then those conditional probabilities, S0 to X0, S1 to X1. And I write it here also uh, more explicitly for reference. So the idea now is that we start with two identical copies of the system. So inst instead of just starting with row, we start with row, tensor row, so independent copies. And we projectively measure on their in initial eigen uh, eigenstates, so on the basis S. So we do a projective measurement on S and S prime. Uh, so this will give us different outcomes with different probabilities. But now we post-select them. So from uh, we only select those experiments where the outcome of uh, the second copy was exactly the same as the outcome of the first one. If they, if they ended up in different outcomes, we throw them away, throw them away and repeat. Uh, and whenever they are equal, we keep it and then we apply a POVM. And this is a product POVM. So on these post-selected states, we measure the first copy on X0, X0 and the second copy on the e, evolved X1, so U times X1. And what, what one gets is that the outcomes of this POVM are exactly the Bayesian network. So uh, we can obtain the Bayesian network from two independent copies, but what we need to do is post selection. We do experiments, throw away some data, only keep the data that uh, matches these two um, uh, outcomes. And on that data, we do another measurement, a POVM. So you will need uh, a lot of copies of two copies, right? Of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay, but I mean, even in the in the in uh, that's what we always do, right? Whenever we do yes. any experiment, yeah. we need we need copies anyway. So 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 yeah. that also uh, uh, yeah. It's just be because you said you needed two copies, so I was wow, you can do something with just two copies, but no, yeah, a lot of copies of two copies. Yeah, you're right. But you're right. Yeah, very nice that you you can actually measure these things with a simple strategy like this. Yeah, yeah, I think this is cool, but I, I agree. Yeah, so I should have been more, more precise. Uh, of course, if you only have two copies, you're in a, like a single shot scenario and there's you can't really obtain the full distribution. Uh, to obtain this distribution, you need to collect statistics from multiple experiments. But the idea is that the experiments are, are performed on simultaneously on, on pairs of copies. Yeah. Uh, just a practical question. If, if you started to add more variables like x0, x1, x2, x3, wouldn't this end up becoming you end up to throw away too too much of the experiment you need to repeat an unreasonable amount of times? Yeah, that's definitely true. Yeah, so then because you really need to have a lot of luck that the outcomes are all equal. Yeah, so so the amount of data that you have to throw away becomes insane. That that's true. That's true. That, that's okay. uh, so so the yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Luckily, uh, um, most of the things, at least in thermodynamics, are two-point measurements. Although I have to say that uh, um, we are planning uh, if, uh, to, to study in more detail these, these um, multi-point uh, um, QBNs. I personally like them. I think it's mathematically beautiful to, to you know, construct this for like multiple points and so on, analyze their statistical properties. But to be fair, I have never found yet uh, um, um, an actual application of QBNs with more than two points. Uh, that's actually something I'm looking at, maybe some kind of like cyclic engine or something uh, where you actually need the QBN for multiple points. And that would be very nice. I mean, I think you could do that with a collision problem, like the, that crazy one we did with Jader. Exactly. So that would be the perfect idea. Uh, but um, then the question in the end of the day is exactly what do you want to do with it, right? So in that paper, we explored kind of the correlations and stuff. Uh, um, 
from at least a thermodynamical perspective, it's not 100% clear, like what other kind of useful things could we do with that? Uh, I mean, it's perfectly fine to just explore the, 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 the um, statistical properties and so on, but it would be nice to also have a, a concrete like use for these kinds of things. In my uh, dissertation, I, I tried to kind of uh, discuss a little bit the case in which you have like many collisions and you want to understand like the accumulated heat along uh, many of them, but uh, things get really, really complicated <laughs> with these kind of expressions and I, I couldn't get too far. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. That, that would be a nice, a nice thing to do, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. But, uh, Mari has a question on the chat also. Oh, sorry. My, I my Mac. Yeah. Yeah. So let me see. Uh, 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 yeah, Mari. Uh, so that's a good point. So why not just prepare them in S? Uh, so uh, yeah, if we could, yes. But we would like to think that somehow these copies, they arrive from some factory, right? Like uh, they arrive by, by buzz or something. And someone just gives you states row. And you get these rows and you have to do some kind of uh, thermodynamic process on these states. But yeah, in principle, we could prepare them just in pure states uh, as, um, um, for instance, I have one experiment with the, the folks in Floripa where they actually do this. They just prepare the, 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 not for Bayesian networks, for, for TPM, but they, they prepare the state just in pure states as uh, and do the experiments. And then afterwards, they, they just, you know, if they want to see some kind of thermal stuff, they put in some probabilities PS. But um, uh, we, we like to think that these rows are like given or something. It's like we can't really have access to, to what's preparing these states. All we have access to are the copies. That's the, the uh, kind of the idea. Yeah. OK. Um, cool. So. Um, yeah, so, so, so let me uh, illustrate this copies idea with a, a, another example. So before uh, I talked about heat exchange between two systems, but this idea of Bayesian networks is very general and one can also uh, use it to study uh, any kind of thermodynamic process. So another one which is very interesting is uh, work protocols in closed systems. So we have a system that's completely isolated. So the, the dynamics of the system is unitary. You just take a state row and you map it to row prime via some unitary. But uh, so now there is no heat exchanged, but there may be work. So this unitary may be performing some work. Uh, so we define the initial and final Hamiltonians. We assume that you know the, the process may change the Hamiltonian. So we have like some Hamiltonian Ni with energies E and I and uh, MF energies EMF for initial and final. And uh, so we define the average work as just a change in, in energy of the system. So initial energy uh, and final energy, right? And, and this is, would be the work associated with this unitary U. So the unitary is, is producing this work. It's the work uh, that an external agent has to provide to apply this unitary. And so it changes the energy of the system. Uh, but again, if we wanna now measure this work, it, it's kind of weird, right? So, so this is a very simple, um, process actually, if you think about it, we're just measuring the change in energy of a system. But how do we actually measure this, right? Because if we wanna measure it from an experiment, then uh, uh, if the system is initially coherent and we do a TPM, this is what's gonna happen. You see the TPM, uh, it, the system is in S and then uh, you measure it in the energy basis Ni. But then in the TPM, this measurement collapses the wave function. And so the evolution is from Ni to MF. And then the average work that you get is, is not the same as this one. It's a different quantity. So by, by actually doing the measurement and trying to estimate this work, you change the process. That's the idea of being extrinsic. You know, you just wanted to help and you screwed things up. It's, it's a, something like that, right? Um, uh, so essentially now, again, you get this defaced row here. Uh, and so this average work is di different from um, uh, what we wanted to, to, to measure. So. If we do Bayesian networks, on the other hand, then everything is okay. So the Bayesian network, uh, we would associate a probability distribution from Ni to S, but we don't measure S uh, uh, in this sense. So there is no collapse here. And so it's S that evolves to US and then you measure MF. And now you can define a work distribution and this work distribution will give the correct 
uh, um, uh, average work. So the QBN gives uh, returns the average, the correct average work. Uh, and this entire discussion is also uh, interesting in association to a now famous paper by Marty and uh, also uh, uh, Antonio Asin, uh, Karen, and so on, which is called this no-goal theorem for quantum work. This is a PRL from 2017. Um, so there they pose the following problem. They uh, say that, you know, work, we would like to associate it to a P of M. So we want to have some kind of P of M, J of W, uh, such that this work distribution is directly the outcomes of this P of M, right? And this distribution has satisfied two properties. First, it has to predict the, the correct average. So, you know, you, you have a P of M that gives you some distribution. And from this, if you take the average of the work, you should get what we would hope for the average work. Uh, and second, second, it should reduce to the TPM when uh, the process is incoherent. So when the system commutes with the initial Hamiltonian. Uh, so, so in the case where you know there is no coherence or anything, uh, we should just get a TPM. But if we now are outside the TPM, we should get something that produces the correct average um, um, work. And what they show is that this is impossible. Uh, uh, if you have a system, it's impossible to devise a POVM that, that does this. Uh, but we, with QBNs, we actually can. So it will not be a POVM on a single system, right? It will be a POVM on, on multiple systems, but we actually can. I write the formula here just for uh, completeness, but that's uh, um, um, not necessary. But essentially, we can cook up a, a, a POVM such that if we now do the trace of this j times rho, we get exactly this uh, a p of w here. So uh, this would be directly the outcomes of this p of n. Uh, so this is very nice uh, because we can have um, the QBNs as directly providing um, um, an alternative to this no go in the sense that it yields the correct uh, average and also reduces to the TPM in the incoherent case. But there is a caveat which is a uh, slightly subtle one, uh, which is uh, what may this J of W depend on? So this is a P of M, and what can this depend on? So uh, it will actually depend on many things. It will depend on the Hamiltonians, HS and HS prime. It will depend on the unitary and so on. In their no-go paper, they argue that it should also not, de not depend on rho. So it may depend on Hamiltonians and unitaries, but the kind of measurement that you do should hold true for any state row. Uh, and in our case, that's not, definitely not true. So we're not, we're also being a little bit careful in claiming that we're violating the no-go. Uh, uh, I mean, we really don't want to get into that, but th this is an interesting caveat. Uh, we can construct a, a P of M from the QBNs, but this will depend on the initial state indirectly because it depends on the populations and the um, uh, against states. Uh, okay, and then finally, we get into uh, Marcelo's latest work, uh, which is to use QBNs to predict work. So this notion of predictor is, um, is not very widely used in physics, but I find it quite beautiful. Uh, here's an example from statistics. Suppose that you have some uh, variable X, which is the um, grades from the college admission exam. So it's a random variable X which uh, tells you the grade of some student in the college admissions, like Fuvestri. Uh, and then Y is uh, the grades of that student in a physics one course. Now these two quantities should definitely be correlated because a student that got very high grades at Fuvestri has a high probability of getting high grades in physics one and so on, right? So they, there should be some statistical correlation between these two things. Uh, and so what we wanna do is we want to predict Y given X. So you're a physics one professor before the exams and you have access to X and you want to be able to predict how well that student will fare. So, so you know, how well would be the grade of that student uh, uh, in your exam based on the, the uh, college admission exams. So what you want to do is you want to cook up a function G of X, which gives you the best prediction of Y given X, right? Uh, and best here, we're talking about best in the sense of minimizing the mean square error. So we want to find some function that minimizes uh, uh, the mean square error. And so the, the input that you need in classical uh, probability theory is essentially a um, conditional probability distribution. So what you would need to do this 
is to know what's the probability that, you know, given that the grade was X, the student will be uh, graded Y in the physics one exam. And this you can, in practice, for instance, you can estimate from previous years, for example. So if you know the grades of the students uh, in both courses from previous years, you can build a table and you can estimate this model. And then from this model, you can make predictions about what's going to be the grade of a student given its uh, entry uh, admission exams. So in our case, we want to do something similar, but for hidden work. So we want to consider this kind of scenario. We have a system interacting with a bath. Uh, and so there may be some heat being exchanged here, but we don't want to measure the system. So we don't want to perturb the system. Uh, but we assume we can measure the bath and that's okay because you know the bath is incoherent usually and it's fine we can measure it so uh, we never touch the system but we do a tpm in the bath and from this tpm we get, we're going to get some heat uh, and we then ask okay so from this heat what is the best guess the best prediction we can make about the work given this information from the heat uh, so this introduces a mixed uh, uh, distribution where there's a TPM on the BAF, but a Bayesian network in the system. So we kind of mix the two. The joint distribution is going to be something like this. Here, uh, N and M are the eigenstates of the system Hamiltonian, and mu, mu prime, are the eigenstates of the BAF Hamiltonian. Uh, and so this joint distribution is going to be a sum over all states, uh, PS, like before. Uh, now we have some also probabilities Q uh, mu, which are the initial uh, thermal probabilities of the bath. And then we have, um, here is the Bayesian network, is that uh, conditional probability, the system is in S, and um, we want to S to find it in Ni. Here, sorry, S is the state of the system, right? So this is the coherent state of the system. Uh, and then we have this big transition probability, where the system is in S, and the BEF is in mu, you apply a unitary, you measure the system in the final energy MF and the BEF in the final energy mu prime. And we want to cook up a predictor of work, which essentially is minimizing. So we want to cook up this, this function here, W of mu mu prime, which minimizes uh, the distance, uh, the mean square error with respect to the actual work, which is M, uh, the difference, the total difference in energy. So this, it's like the final energy of system plus BEF minus the initial energy of system plus bath. Uh, and the way we write that down, and Marcelo will talk a lot more about this, I think, is uh, in terms of the cross operators uh, of the system. And this is very nice. So the system is interacting with the bath and you can, def you can describe that as a quantum channel. And you have some cross operators which depend on the bath eigenstates. Uh, and each, the trajectory is here for the bath are given by these uh, um, probabilities P of mu mu prime, which are just you know, the expectation values of the, the system in these um, cross operators. And what we have obtained is a explicit formula for the mean square prediction of work given heat. So essentially we have here a term which depends on the energies of the bath. And we have an expression which depends only on the um, cross operators of the uh, of, of the process and the, the Hamiltonian of the system. And so this is our, our, the main result of our, our recent paper, which uh, provides an explicit formula for the optimal mean square prediction, predictor uh, uh, to predict work given only heat. And let me try to illustrate that with an example. So uh, this is actually motivated from this experimental paper so Yuka Pekola uh, is um, a group leader in Finland, and they, they have many, many papers on experimental quantum thermodynamics. And here they propose a method to measure work from measurements of heat. So it's very similar to what uh, we're, we're um, studying here. And in this example, we assume that the, the, um, the process can be divided in two parts. Actually, sorry, this is E, um, E here. Um, we assume that the process can be divided in two parts. So uh, first, we have the system in isolation, uh, completely isolated, and we apply a unitary UW. So we do some work on the system. You, you, you can imagine that we apply a work protocol, like we have a qubit, and um, uh, for instance, we apply a unitary sigma x, which is going to perform some work in the system. And then after that, we allow the system to exchange heat with the bath. 
So we assume, for instance, that the bath is also a qubit. It's in a thermal state, and we apply unitary, which the simplest unitary you can imagine is a swap. So we first do some work in the system, and then we want to measure how much work was done. And so to measure it, we probe it with the bath. Right? Uh, and I'm going to assume a generic initial state of the system for concreteness. So we have an initial state that has some coherence uh, uh, and some populations and so on. In particular, this angle theta, uh, if it's zero or pi, then we have an incoherent state. And if theta is not zero, uh, then we have some coherences. And so I want to finish my discussion with this table actually, which uh, shows uh, the kinds of transitions that we can observe in the bath. So this is like the possible jumps that one could observe by measuring the bath. Uh, this is the work involved. So how much work was actually uh, uh, associated to that transition. Uh, and this is uh, what, the predict, pre what the predictor is. So what, what are the predictions? So for instance, uh, let's start with this case, which is like incoherent. So this is the predictor of work uh, when uh, this initial state of the system is incoherent. And so you see that if we go and we measure the bath and we see a click, like the bath goes from zero to one, there is a transition. The actual work associated to this transition is omega and the predictor is, is right on. So it, it, it uh, uh, makes a prediction which is actually exact. It predicts the same amount of uh, work that actually happened. Uh, but we can also have a situation where there is no click in the bath. So the bath, nothing happened. There was, there was no transition. It's, it started in zero, stayed in zero. And the work associated to this is actually minus omega. Uh, and the predictor is not great. I mean, it, it does predict something. It predicts that the work is going to be minus omega times some factor which is associated to the initial state. So, you know, it's trying. It's, 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 it, this is the best that one can do given the information, right? Because this is an optimal predictor. So this is the best that we can possibly do with the information at hand. Uh, if we now have coherence, then things become more complicated. Uh, now the, the predicted works are, I mean, in all cases, they're never exactly uh, the same as the actual works, but we do get something which is like close if the coherence is small. If the coherence is very, very high, then the predictor can be very bad, but uh, uh, that's because, you know, we don't have any information available. But if the coherence is small, then we can actually make some reasonable predictions. So essentially, that's what I had to say. Um, what, I, what I talked about was this idea of quantum Bayesian networks. And the, the, the headline is that this is nice if you want to talk about multi-time quantities without measurement back action. So you, you, know, you want to have something which depends on multiple times, but you want to avoid the annoying measurement back action, then QBNs is the, the uh, framework to use. And this is particularly relevant for coherent processes. Uh, even though they may seem artificial at first, you can actually obtain these QBNs from experiments if you use multiple copies of a system. And they have very nice properties. In particular, I, I discussed fluctuation theorems and how they can be used to uh, verify fluctuation theorems, a, a, a fully quantum fluctuation theorem involving not only uh, thermodynamic quantities such as heat and so on, but also informational quantities such as work and so on. Uh, and finally, I discussed how uh, one can use QBNs to uh, construct um, uh, estimation schemes which are actually relevant for experiments. So to really be able to approximately predict uh, uh, properties from ex simple experiments. Uh, now, I'm, we're currently looking at other potential applications of this. So uh, uh, as uh, Chimpa mentioned, there is these ideas of looking at multipoint QBNs that would be very nice. Uh, Marcelo has done a lot of work uh, on these continuous time engines where you have like three level systems which are coupled to baths. Uh, and so you have this continuous time uh, description of the engine and their coherences. This is also a very nice approach. I would love to, to use this for metrology, um, maybe thermometry, but metrology in general. I would love to make a connection between QBMs and metrology because I think that this is really beyond thermal. What I'm talking about here, I mean, thermal was a big motivation for us, but uh, uh, I think that these ideas are really more general. Uh, and also I'm open to any other uh, uh, suggestions. <laughs> uh, I think this would be, there are many nice things that one could explore. So uh, I just finished here with the list of references and uh, thanks, yeah.
So I don't know if you guys have any questions. Gabriel, I think you you explained that, but I didn't understand that result. You said that was the main result with Marcelo. I think that two slides before. Right. So it's it's um, yeah this one yeah. Yeah, Oops, this sorry. all right. This cross map, a cross matrix, are, are they are how how do you find that? Or you're just assuming that it is just some cross matrix. Right. So, so the idea is that um, uh, we are assuming this kind of configuration where the system comes in and interacts with a path. And so uh, from this interaction, so there's going to be some, some unitary here, U, and some initial bath state, like a thermal state, for instance. And then from this, uh, you actually determine the cross operators. So the cross operators, they are a function of the initial state of the bath, which are these Q mu, and the, the uh, uh, unitary u. Mm -hmm. So, so essentially, uh, uh, this 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 cross operators would be the the how the system uh, views this global evolution between system and bath is the system's perspective on this global evolution. All right. So, you so is this that how this is like the optimal optimal approximation you can have. Yeah, so, so this, this result would be the best predictor. Yeah, so it, it's um, the predictor which minimizes the mean squared error. All right. Uh, because, I mean, you could, you could make many predictors, mm -hmm. right? So, so you don't have to work with the optimal predictor. You can, you know, a, in principle, I mean, as far as predictors are concerned, the predictor is a function g of x which tries to predict y given x. It can be a terrible mm -hmm. function, right? You can make horrible yeah. predictions. Uh, but the optimal predictor is the one that gives the smallest possible mean squared error. Mm -hmm. oh, that's, that's nice. So you, you prove that you can do this using cross matrices. Exactly. We can represent the, the optimal predictor using only the, the information from the cross operators oh. that dictate. All right. Process. Okay, that's nice. Thank you. This result is a little bit kind of a ugly expression, but if you look uh, closely to it, it is indeed kind of a first law of thermodynamics because you have uh, work at the left-hand side and you have uh, heat plus a very strange way of writing the uh, internal energy. This is kind of the in, how does the uh, internal energy reacts when you measure uh, the bath. This is kind of the interpretation. That's really, really nice. <laughs> okay, um, any other questions? Okay then, uh, I guess that's it. Um,